Say the word cute em up to most shmup fans, and the first game that's going to pop into their head is likely to be Cotton. Originally released way back in 1991, this horizontal scroller sees you take control of the eponymous red-haired witch and team up with a fairy named Silk, ostensibly to down the evils and save our world, but really to get your hands on a stash of delicious willow candies. 30 years on from that original release, Cotton is back in this reboot from Beep, and I have to say I don't think those willows have ever tasted so good. Included in this single package we have the original game in the form of its X68000 release, a brand new arranged reboot of that game, and something I didn't know about until I booted this up, a new caravan mode. The X68000 version of the original seems to be the connoisseur's choice of the various versions. I haven't played them all personally so I wouldn't know, but that seems to be the consensus. And it is a solid and fun shmup, even if for me its reputation just slightly outweighs its actual worth as a game. The main event of this new release however is of course going to be the new arrange mode, and that's what we're going to focus on for this review. The game is not currently available in English, so first up let's look at the mechanics because A, they might be a bit hard to work out if you don't read Japanese, and B, they are both plentiful and slightly unusual. So first up, you shoot to the right like in most horizontal shooters, but you also drop ground shots at quite short intervals as part of your main shot. Killing enemies and picking up the gems they drop increases your experience and also your shot power, as indicated by the orange bar at the centre of the bottom of the display. One thing fans of the first game will notice immediately is that your main shot in this arranged version looks and feels a lot more powerful than your shot in the original game. Certain colours of gems, red, blue, green and purple, grant you limited use magical powers that effectively work as the game's bomb system. Shooting gems can change their colour, so it's possible to tailor the pickups to whatever you're looking for, but only if you can create enough time and space to change them to your preference. The original game only had red and blue magic, which released a fiery dragon or an electric blast respectively, but we now also have the purple bomb attack and green avalanche attacks to add to our arsenal. You can pick these up pretty regularly, meaning you can use them pretty regularly too, and just like your main shot you can increase the level of these magic powers by picking up more gems before you unleash them. Levels are indicated on your stock which is in the bottom right corner of the screen. On top of that, holding down the bomb button before releasing changes the effect from offensive to defensive, giving a total of 8 different magical powers, which sounds a lot to think about, but actually works perfectly intuitively. As mentioned, you are accompanied by the fairy Silk, who is also an unlockable playable character by the way, and you can pick up more fairies as you progress through the game, with your winged companions adding to your offensive power. Stages, of which there are seven, end of course with bosses, although the last stage is just a boss fight, and after defeating each boss it is tea time, a bonus section which sees teacups rain from the sky. Collect as many as you can for points, or try to avoid them all for a potentially even bigger bonus. Most of what I've described so far will sound familiar to those of you who've played the original, but you might also have noticed this second green meter down in the bottom left of the screen. Fill this to 100% and you can enter a kind of overpower mode which will grant you potentially massive scores for enemies killed while it's activated. In order to get these massive scores, you have to fire your shot through a gem, which will then refract it and turn each enemy hit into a multiplier icon. Depending on your experience level, these multipliers can shoot up to times 1024 very quickly and hitting one just before a crowd of popcorn enemies floods onto the screen is extremely satisfying from both a scoring point of view and from a visual one. One more mechanic regarding the gems is that if you shoot one for a long time it will eventually turn dark, and if you keep shooting it it will break. When the gem is dark you can no longer shoot through it, and in fact it will block your shot, but you can pick it up for a points bonus. Picking up dark gems in succession without breaking any increases that bonus to something pretty worthwhile. All of this means that in the reboot, scoring becomes far more central to proceedings, but while the system may seem complex, it doesn't really boil down to much more than shoot everything and activate your overpower whenever possible. The overpower gauge charges really quickly, so waiting for optimal moments to unleash it isn't usually the best strategy, since oftentimes instead of waiting, you could have just used it, recharged it, and then use it again, 
especially since gems are almost always hanging about somewhere on screen. Also, unlike in the original game, gems hang in the air rather than dropping, meaning you rarely have to aim for a specific one to reap the rewards when using the overdrive. This leaves a potentially unique and tactical mechanic rather hamstrung. If there were fewer gems, for example, finding one and getting behind it to make sure your shot was refracted would be a skill and strategy based mechanic that could really mix up playing for score versus playing for survival. As things are, however, you can just fire and hope and 90% of the time you will be rewarded. What this all means is that the main way to score big is basically just to make sure you maintain that multiplier at any cost. Taking hits obviously drops you down in experience, and therefore it's imperative you survive and keep your multiplier intact more than anything else. In other words, despite seeming complex, what you actually have to do is the same as most shmups. Just survive and shoot stuff, and if you can do both effectively, that's how you'll rack up a big score. Now I will say, hitting those big multipliers and seeing them filling up the entire right hand side of the screen is going to light up the inside of your head like a dozen jackpots all at once in a crowded pachinko parlour, and hitting several overdrives in quick succession feels bloody awesome. One small problem here though is that in amongst all the gems and multiplier icons, enemy shots can sometimes sneak unnoticed and I've taken more than a few cheap shots through bullets getting hidden in the chaos. Given everything that's going on however, in general the game does a good job of making things clear to the player. Everything is bright and shiny and most importantly immediately obvious to the eye. This is despite the background visuals which have been completely overhauled and redrawn for this, being full of detail and whimsy that's always cleverly coloured to stand out and look thoroughly impressive without being distracting. Or at least almost always, the fiery caverns stage can cause a bit of confusion, but in general the contrast is usually good. On the topic of visuals, one thing that's really interesting about Cotton is that despite being unashamedly a cutema, there is more darkness here than you'd usually expect from the subgenre. You'll be flying over graveyards populated with various ghouls and ghosts and taking on grim reaper-like bosses to whom the word cute definitely does not apply. Personally, I really love these overhauled visuals, but remember, if you don't, the original is always there for you to go back to as well. As mentioned, there is also a caravan mode that sees you given the choice of either playing for 2 minutes or 5 minutes through a specially created kind of coliseum-like stage. These each have their own online boards, and you can kind of see some of the scoring system's weaknesses here by observing how bunched up the scores are. I'm used to jumping on leaderboards like this and finding some guy in Japan has found all these exploits and has racked up a score 50 times higher than my own. Here the differences, while still there, are smaller and indicate that despite the wealth of mechanics on paper, in practice there's not as much depth as it would first seem. Now caravan modes are usually considered a nice little extra, but having one here is actually of far more importance, and not for a good reason. Rather, it's due to one of two massive oversights that unfortunately mar an otherwise great package. The first of these is that, although the game offers online leaderboards for each of its two versions, even going so far as to separate them out by difficulty, continuing neither resets nor voids your score, rendering these boards almost entirely worthless. With no local leaderboard, this means that despite all the score mechanics that have been added, it's almost all for nothing. This is especially strange to see in a release of such otherwise high quality, and I just do not understand why they function like this. It's a huge oversight and one that seriously hampers all that good work in creating the new scoring system in the first place. The second major issue is the total lack of any training features whatsoever. There are no save states, there's no rewind, there's not even a stage select. In fact, in the main game, there's not even a quick restart, and with fairly long load times for a shmup, that makes practicing even the early stages something of a chore. Now, in a budget release, you can kind of get away with this, but at 45 US dollars or 35 British pounds for the eShop version, that's really a bit of a letdown, especially since something as basic as just a level select ought to be very easy to implement far easier than all the huge amount of work that's gone into overhauling the visuals and adding these fun new mechanics. These two problems, coupled with the missed potential of the scoring system, mean that although the base games are excellent, the package as a whole feels slightly less so. Which is such a shame because, as mentioned, these things ought to be so much easier to do than all the rest of the fantastic work that has been done. 
but let's not be too down. We still have here a revamped version of a beloved shmup that both looks and plays great. We have arguably the best original version of that same beloved shmup, and we have a fun pair of online caravan modes to add longevity. The presentation both inside and outside the game is excellent, with not just the in-game visuals having been remade, but those notorious little cutscenes having been spruced up too, and a nice little semi-animated uh, manual added to explain the systems. Overall, it's a very worthy package, and I'd still rate this at an 8 out of 10, but at the same time, there is just that slight feeling of an opportunity having been missed through schoolboy errors. I'd definitely say pick this up if you have the chance, but be aware that some of the features you may be expecting at this price point are not here. So Cotton Reboot is currently Japan only, but it is coming physically to the West sometime soon, and hopefully that will lead to a Western eShop release too. I know the original is looked back on very fondly by a lot of people, so do let us know your thoughts on either this reboot if you've played it, or on the original itself. Thanks as ever for watching, and I hope to see you next time. Cheers!